Okay, so today um, we have Farzad Khan here. Uh, he's going to be talking to us about um, uh, power of integrating project process and change management to maximize business value. So just to give you a little uh, background about him, Farzad Khan is an accomplished business prof professional with over 16 years of management consulting experience. He has successfully delivered complex, complex projects for global companies spanning banking, technology, retail, and professional services. Farzad offers a unique integrated approach of combining project management, change management, and process management to deliver on business clients' business goals. He also leads a management consulting firm, Strategic Font, that focuses on delivering services related to project process and change management. Without further ado, I just wanted to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Farzad Khan. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. So I heard the morning session was on uh, living large. Mm -hmm. You all are living large, I presume? Yeah. <laughs> that, that's amazing. <clears throat> all right. So first thing is, um, thanks for coming in here. And hopefully the next hour, we're going to have a great time talking about integration of different kind of three disciplines into one and sort of, you know, take us through the journey as well. Um, I do a lot of the presentations at the university as well as part of my training activity. I feel quite wired here right now, so hopefully I'll get over it in about uh, six minutes. Let's get started. Before we get started here, just wanted to let you know there's some slides here. Um, feel free to come by after the presentation and pick it up. And I'm going to just hand out some information that you can, you can use, um, you can use um, after as well. And I think the presentation files are also available, so you can kind of download them. So all really is needed right now is your participation, your input. Uh, don't worry about any of the other material. Let's get started. <clears throat> so I think you've already provided the quick introduction here. Uh, from an overall perspective, um, I'm leading Strategic Front, which really the foundations of what we're going to talk about today in the next one hour. And I welcome your input right through the session is actually built around integrating project, process, and change. And that's specifically what we do as part of the work in uh, Strategic Front Consulting. Now, <clears throat> one of the models that, we, models that we have is helping clients succeed. So it's an important piece. The reason is, it's not about us as professionals. It's not about us as companies. It's about clients and, and making them successful. Now, clients could be your, within your internal organization, a department that you're serving, which may be on the business side or on the technology side. But the whole idea is the whole client-centric approach. And every day when we come into work, like Monday through Sunday even, um, you know, coming in and then having that purpose in life that, okay, I'm coming into work to make a client successful. The other piece about client is we often think about client as an organization. Okay, I'm here to help XYZ organization. Yeah, absolutely, we're helping as professionals organizations out as well, but also break it down to individuals as a client. Who are you helping today? And you know, if you walk into a workplace every day thinking about which client specifically, the person X or the person Y, you're gonna help her or him be successful, I think our work every day is gonna be so much more purposeful. Now the next part about succeed. I have a deep feeling that we won't be able to make someone successful unless we have failed ourselves. The reason is, failure really is the, is the best vehicle uh, to learn, to grow, and so that you know what to do and what not to do when we're either making ourselves successful or making our clients successful. I'm not sure if you'll agree with that. So let's dive into first the failure part before we get into the success part of the equation. <clears throat> so why projects fail? So um, overall, there's a lot of words here, but the picture, the comic here, really gets down into a huge percentage, percentage, a third of the project. When senior management, and even if we are in that seat, um, many of us here as well, if they ask why is the project failing, the answer could be, you know, look at the mirror. So it really gets down into lack of senior management involvement within the project. Now, whether you're a project, project manager, 
business analyst, change professional. Uh, certainly, we need to, you know, there's that mirror aspect of it as well on how can we help the project become successful. But I think it's also upon us to involve the senior manager and to actually specifically kind of, you know, work with them to, to kind of get their input, get their feedback, get them involved, charged up to deliver the project with us. They're a partner with us as opposed to kind of, you know, against, against each other. So, so I think that's the main piece that's gonna help reduce the percentage. <laughs> now let's get down into some detailed numbers here as well. <clears throat> the first one, this really says 97.5% of companies have failed projects. By failed projects, we mean projects that were you know, delivered on time, on budget, and on scope, or if it was even delivered, the outcome wasn't fully realized. Now, it's not saying 97.5% of projects fail. It's saying 97.5% of companies have failed projects. That means there's very few companies out there that do not have failed projects. So how can we actually dial this number down more? And hopefully some of the discussion today is going to help us. The next piece is 37% of the project do, do not achieve the objective. And by objective, I don't mean that if my project is to walk from here until the end of the, of the, of the room there, that may be a project delivery, well done, but what's the purpose of me walking from here to the back of the room? If that's the objective of the organization. It's just not to implement the system. It's ju just not to design a new process, but it is to help the overall broader objective of the organization, and that's what's sort of classified as a project success. And many of the projects are kind of 37% is in the failure zone. A Little bit kind of you know, less alarming is the whole IT aspect, aspect of things. This chart, the, the IT part, the third number, used to be a lot, lot more, five or even you know, eight years back. So now it stands at about 17% where IT projects do not align back with uh, business objectives. So I think, uh, so knowing that you know, projects are failing, but also knowing what can we do to actually help them out. So comes the three disciplines. <clears throat> The reason it says failure at the end is because I mentioned it earlier in the presentation, we learn through failure, therefore now we are positioned to help clients succeed. So let's think about it one by one. Project. At the end of the day, what does project management do? It helps with organization of delivery, right? Whether it's scope management, budget management, people management and all of that, it really is the organization part of a project delivery. Now, if we organize ourselves really well for, for a project that lacks innovation, if, we're organization, if you're organizing ourselves very well, implementing a technology where the technology was wrong to begin with, is that project ultimately going to succeed? No, because you would have deliver, delivered successfully the wrong product. It's almost like saying a doctor saying the operation was successful, but the patient died. Right? So, you know, they've done everything right to do the operation successfully, but the outcome was a failure. So that would have been the case when you do project management in silo really well, well organized, well delivered, but guess what? You just delivered the wrong product or the wrong solution. So that's, that's one piece of failure. Second is process. My career started out in uh, process consulting, and we were, you know, going into client sites, doing current state process, you know, figuring out what the issues were, designing a, designing a wonderful future state process. Once we left, you know, one month passed, six months passed, 12 months passed, guess what? The process documents we, we shared with the client um, as part of the consulting work, they were shitting, sit, sitting in the shelf and really not, not much was happening about it. In other words, process, once delivered in its silo, without project management or change management, it just sits on the shelf. So again, a case of failure by looking at process individually in a myopic view. Let's talk about the third part, which I think is the most important piece amongst the three here. So this is about human behavior change. The, by far, the, the most difficult of the three to do. It's easy to do a project plan and deliver a project. It's easy to kind of you know, do the process engineering world, world. But when you're talking about change management, which gets down into the behavioral aspect of of not your project team, that's the least of your concerns, but your overall user base, as well as your overall stakeholder group that may not even be in the room. 
uh, with your clients. So change management is about getting out there, getting the word out, getting the involvement from all the end users, and truly getting them to change the behavior uh, that the project outcome is supposed to, supposed to deliver. So again, if you deliver project right, well-organized project, if you've got an innovative solution through process, but if the behavioral aspect is not there, guess what, again, the project tends to fail overall. Would you agree with all of that? Awesome. So now that we know uh, the percentage of, you know, high percentage failure of projects, now that we know how looking at project process and change in its silo can actually eventually lead to failure, let's look at it one, one, one last piece here. There are four underlying causes why projects fail. First one I already mentioned, which is task merging, which really means how do you take these individual pieces of project, process, change, maybe there's other aspects to it, technology, data, looking at it sort of, you know, myopically, but then they don't really merge together. So the whole integrated aspect is, is one of the reasons of project failure. I don't know if you all know about, I'm sure you probably know about the stories of uh, Steve Jobs when he was um, going through university and then he didn't really, uh, you know, he didn't have enough funds to support him through universities. So um, he started to attend just random courses uh, just showing up in a class. And that's where he kind of, you know, attended, you know, calligraphy courses. And that's how those, you know, wonderful fonts came in. He attended design courses. And then, you know, that's how, you know, design of his products came in. He attended business courses. That's where he's, he's able to successfully take a product and make it, make it really marketable out uh, from a solution perspective. So really what, what, he, what the lessons learned is, he was learning about integrated design, integrated delivery, integrated products. So when we come to project process and change, first pieces are on task merging. In other words, you know, lack of integration. The second is failure within success. This is exactly the point on operation was successful, but the patient failed. You have delivered the project, but guess what? You just delivered the wrong product. So knowing how your projects and outcome aligns with the goals of the organization is how we can eliminate failure within success. Let's look at the third one, missing the big picture. So how does this one project that we're doing align with the overall portfolio of projects in the organization? How does the portfolio within the organization align with things that are happening in the industry? Right? And then the pie just gets bigger. So knowing how our one small project or large project fits into the overall big picture is another reason for failure. We're together. And the last piece is around people. And again, I really feel like the most difficult to change, uh, you know, to, to recover from, you know, for, apart from the other three that we just talked about, ignoring behavioral aspects. So knowing that there's a technical or delivery side to a project, but then there's also a human side to a project. And these days there's a lot of talk around human experience. And by human, it's not just the customers, but it's internal employees, your project team, um, your end users, external stakeholders, and certainly the, the, the direct clients that you're serving. With us on that? Do, did we have enough of failure? <laughs> so, so that's like 10 years of failure in like 10, 12 minutes. <clears throat> All right, so now, you're probably asking, great, we get it. How can we help kind of, you know, turn the wheel around? Let's talk about the next step now, the value of project process and change. This is what we preach by every day, and we're gonna see a model in the next slide on how our model kind of, we're, we're being very successful applying it in client cases, client projects, one after the other and really kind of you know, gaining the success momentum one project at a time. So, as we've talked about, project, process, and change in its silo leads to failure. But when it's integrated, it actually leads to success. So here's the model. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a few minutes to discuss the model with you all. So let's think about it as a house where there are three three bedrooms, one is project, process, and change. No room in a house really works in silo. So, you know, for example, the infrastructure around, say, um, you know, gas, or heat, or cooling, or water, they all work integrated 
in, in a house. So similarly, how can we use project process and change to work really well in this house structure? We start at the top. Our overall, our overall goal in projects is to maximize business value. Whether it's business value through people, or business value through technology, or business value through just pure dollars. So that's our overall objective. But that's at the roof. Let's go down one step further. Business value is achieved through integration. Integration of the three areas, project process change, that really has to work together. But the first thing is project. As we deliver projects in organizations, Every project, if I were to go to each of your organizations and ask, how do you run your project? All of us are project managers or business analysts or change managers, but the way we run projects in one organization differs quite differently from another organization. And even if you look into many of the larger organizations like banks, maybe retailers, insurance firms, or, or others as well in the industry or even hospitals, even if you go into one of those organizations and you look at different lines of business, they probably run uh, the different lines of business. The projects are run quite differently from one another. And that's where project management maturity assessment comes in. So how mature is your project from the perspective of, do you run your project in an ad hoc basis? Do you have a defined structure and defined, uh, you know, defined templates and processes to run your project? Do you track, you know, from a measurement perspective, data on how successful your projects are you know, how profitable they are, how many people you're using, you know, how your estimations work, you know, across the board. So, so knowing all of that is the whole idea about project management maturity. And once you know how your projects are run through maturity assessment from one department to another or overall for your organization, you'll be able to gauge more on, where, on, on, on the question of how your projects are, are delivered. So that's the first question. How is the project delivered? We covered that, covered that through uh, maturity assessment. The next piece is, and I, I, we're not going down too much into detail in this, but there's a lot of sessions that I know that's happening in the conference is around agile project delivery, right? The whole aspect of agile delivery is again going back to maxima, maximizing business value. So long are the days where we're delivering a project for 12 months, 18 months and all of that, and then you know, there's not enough appetite to wait for that long. So uh, you know, probably projects are not funded even well you know, beyond, beyond six months to 12 months. So agile project delivery is how can, we, how can we deliver value on a more incremental basis, and more importantly, learn on an incremental basis on if we're going on the right track, or should we actually kind of steer path in the right way. That really is at the end of the day agile. So that's the next part around agile project delivery. And then you've got your program and portfolio and project. So all three things work together. So you know, one of the reasons for failure was not knowing the big picture. So the third bullet in there is really about knowing the portfolio of projects, knowing the pro program that makes up the project, and as well as the individual projects itself to make it successful. This whole big picture thinking is around the third bullet of uh, portfolio, program, and project management. So we're with, we're with together from a project perspective. Now let's see how we can take those three elements and integrate it with process. So if project management is about organization, process, I would say, is about innovation. So this is how things work in an organization, as opposed to how do you deliver a project. We already covered that in the first part. How do things work in an organization? How do kind of, you know, if you go through an end-to-end -end cycle, how does marketing happen? How does sales happen? How does, you know, the, the product or the processes product or the services that we're delivering to our end clients, how, do the, how does the operations of that work? And, and, and you know, closing down the cycle in terms of how does the customer retention and all of that work as well. So knowing the business process design is the next part which gets into innovation. Now again, just like the project big picture, business process design big picture is around also, you know, are you taking if the project processes go from A to, A to Z, you know, which parts of the process are we kind of, you know, handling? Are we doing the sales management process today? Or, you know, are we doing operations management? So really knowing specifically which area of process are you trying to improve? And knowing what that specific process, kind of how that relates to the rest of the organization. So that's the business process design. Now, 
business process design is really hard to implement these days without some kind of a tool or automation. So that's where the next bullet comes in. Now that you've designed the process, so let's say you know, if you've designed a way to kind of deliver an asset management process, let's say, what kind of software or tool would you use for asset management? If you have designed a process around customer experience, what kind of customer experience tools will we be using from an automation perspective? So that's the next bullet, process digitization and automation. So really that's where the innovation again comes into play. The third one, robotic process automation, is really a subset of automation itself. So where you know tools like RPA, um, anybody worked on RPA projects yet? What are some of the tools you use? I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but there's a couple of them. It's going to come to me. Um, so robotic process automation is a subset of uh, overall process automation. So the whole idea of processes is you know, looking at the organization and see how they're delivering it, trying to make it as efficient as possible, as effective as possible, and using technology to do that. So that's process. Um, by integrating just project with process, what we're trying to avoid is so that we ensure that we're delivering the right solution. There was one of the client projects that we did where we delivered a HR management solution, uh, but, but, at the, but quite into the project towards delivery, towards UAT, we found out that we were delivering the wrong product because that particular product that we're, we were delivering really didn't integrate uh, from the perspective of the client had global uh, offices uh, for HR management. So across North America, Europe, and into Asia as well. And, um, the system that we were implementing weren't able to integrate the different kind of the global aspect, whether it's currency or vacations or, you know, uh, there's many of the global uh, related use cases. It wasn't able to kind of deliver on that. We found out about it towards the, quite towards the end of the project. Um, and at that time, we were just delivering the wrong product in a very well organized way. So that's where the process and the project comes in. Let's talk about change. So change management, again, is about, at the end of the day, do the people, do the people that are the end users or the stakeholders of the project, are they getting enough value? And the way we kind of know that is we start out any change management activities through some kind of a people change assessment. So knowing who your users are, knowing who your stakeholders are, and assessing where are they in the change journey. Are they aware of what this project is even about? Are they aware of how the project fits into the broader organization? And are they aware of how this project or the end product fits into them, like individually? So that's the assessment. And, and then the next question is, are they willing to change now that, now that they are aware? So that's the assessment piece. The next piece is, based on the change assessment results, we have to plan the project in a certain way. And by planning, we mean, you know, how do we get state, uh, leadership involvement? So having some specific tactics around that. So maybe the leadership sets, you know, sends out some kind of a communication. Maybe they have town halls and all of that about this particular project to get the, get the people all, all, all you know, um, worked up to, uh, to, 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 to be on board. Another aspect of planning could be communication. So what are the different communications that we can deliver? Um, and then um, change delivery is around delivering all of these tactics to the end, to the end uh, to the end users. So now that we know the different aspects of project process and change, the last piece from a foundation's perspective is people are aligned, tools or technology is aligned, techniques, the way the people are delivering the services or the product is aligned, and as well as their, their end service to the, to the end clients or the overall stakeholders outside of the organization, the end services are also aligned. So, Using project process change, the different disciplines out there in an integrated way to really reach the foundations of alignment between amongst people, tool, te techniques, and services. So that really is the model that we're after. Okay. Now, we talked about helping clients succeed. If we apply that integrated model, model of project process and change, organization objectives are met a lot more than otherwise. 
project execution risk is mi minimized, right? Because you know not just the project, but also the process and the people aspect of things. Delivery within assigned timelines. You probably improve your delivery timelines. <coughs> improved human experience. This is around client experience, employee experience, customer experience, and other stakeholder experience as well. Because you've targeted that through change management. Financial targets achieved. So this is the profitability part. Not only have you delivered well, but you've also delivered it with, you know, with, with uh, <coughs> excuse me, high level of financial targets. Some success stories. So I'm not going to talk about all three of them because we have a limited time. Um, but let's talk about one of them, which is the second one there, post-merger integration. So one of our retail clients, one of the bigger uh, post-merger deals, uh, in Canada, um, $15 billion retail deal. We came in as program management for our, for our, for our post-merger integration project. The specific area that we were involved in is their procurement side of things. So our work is to really integrate the two, two uh, organizations into one procurement practice and to deliver it from a project management perspective. But we said, no, we just can't do that. We have to look at the two organizations' procurement process first and then you know, see where there's integration that we can do on a process side of things before we get into program or project management of integration. So we help them design the process and then help, help it integrate. Then we looked at the two departments, procurement uh, people, like the department, like actual people who are in the procurement department. So what is their mindset? How, how are they going to help, how are we going to help them merge in this new process perspective because they were doing procurement in very different ways. So looking at it from a people perspective and getting everyone to buy in into this single unifying department of procurement. And then we took a step back. Now that we've got the process aligned, the people aligned within procurement, then how can we actually do a, do a backtrack into program and project management to help deliver on the integration goals? So really maximizing again the, the benefits to the organization through integrating, as we said, the process, the change, the project, uh, towards the goal of uh, post-merger integration for this client. A lot has been covered in a very short amount of time. <clears throat> Any comments, questions? Yes? Have you ever worked on a project where you're doing project management but someone, like another vendor or another organization is doing the process and then yet another one is doing the change management, and how does that whole collabor collaboration happen? Exactly, and that's where your leadership and management skills also come in. Not saying that, like for example, the experience with the post-merger integration, we were responsible for program and project management. We delivered that, but did we do the processes as well? Not fully, we got the process department in that client organization to work with us. They also had a change management department as well that was outside of our project management, but we actually got them involved as part of the project. So good question. So not always will we be doing all three of them, but knowing how we can leverage the other areas to help participate in the integrated approach. And that's where actually, uh, for those of you, if you leave your uh, business cards here, I'm going to be actually giving out the book here on managing people. This is around how do we leverage others in the, in the client organization or project organization to help drive the integration efforts. Any other questions? So, yes. the biggest takeaway for us in that is people integration is difficult. Mind you, in the procurement de departments, there were people in each of the organizations that were there for over 10, 15, 20 years, right? They've been doing it in one way. So getting the process was easy to change, the project was easy to plan, but getting to them, you know, my heart rate would actually go up by three points, right? Because it's just so fast paced. 
The other one that got integrated, if I walked into their organization, my, you know, I would relax a little bit more just because you know, they were more you know, with the healthcare industry and uh, it, it helped kind of you know, with the whole people culture. But that how do you actually bring the two of them together? So the people aspect of things was very hard. That's what we learned. Yes? So just as an example for that post merger, did you encounter any uh, challenges or opportunities for the governments with the work that's going to be from those groups and project their project management sessions? Right. <coughs> from a governance perspective, because we were working with the procurement department of, with the two areas. So certainly they're, 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 they negotiated very differently from one to the other, right? Procurement, they're getting, let's say, you know, procuring, procuring the chair from, from other you know, organizations. The way one did the negotiation was very different from the other. So there were different thresholds from negotiation perspective with, uh, with governance. So yes, if that's the kind of governance you're discussing. Um, more, I guess my question is more <coughs> governance as far as the management of intake of work. Oh, I see. Okay. So, I guess some consideration of uh, project prioritization, management of intake of work, prioritizing those inside project management as far as the head office. Yes, so I think the whole governance around intake is an important piece to consider. In this case, since we were just working with the procurement of the two organizations, the, there wasn't really overall intake of projects that we're kind of bringing in for, for overall running the procurement department, like say intake for their SAP project or their Oracle project. We were more looking at, okay, this is the department, the current state is one uses SAP, here's the process, the other uses Oracle, here's the process, how do we merge that in? So how do we do this? The the sign ups. Okay, someone's passing it around. Okay, great. So if uh, if you're are able to um, to put in your business cards in there, I don't know where that box is. Then we can do a little draw. Um, I know it's three past twelve. Oh, uh, we have, okay. Sorry. Yeah, we have we have sufficient time, right? Okay, so that's good. So you know what? Let's continue on with some of the other questions that you have. Quick question, please. Yes. If you're working in more of an agile environment, yes. what do you think the biggest challenge would be to integrate those three areas? Because standalone change management, you're dealing with people, you're trying to move them from point A to point B. Process, you want to be able to understand the current and future state. Working in an agile delivery state, you're really looking at short increments and, and looking at delivery. What would be the biggest challenge that you would be facing in trying to merge the three of those? Right. So actually, let's go back to the other case study, the customer success that we had. <clears throat> Adoption of new agile processes within a bank. <clears throat> so getting to the question, how do we use agile to integrate project process and change? So in the bank that we were working with, they were traditionally using, this was a couple years back actually, the, the waterfall method. And the bank had actually come up with the, with the actual methodology for Agile. The issue and why they brought us in is around actually change management. But not necessarily in adopting Agile, more so if you're already in yeah. an Agile state. Right. And you are delivering something and you need to, you want yes. to think about those, those other two areas. Yeah, absolutely. So within Agile, what we have done is when we delivered out the Agile delivery project, is we actually had competencies built into it. So there was competencies around project, there was competencies around business analysis, around quality assurance, but we also had competencies around process, as well as change, as well as data and technology as well. So within the agile delivery framework, we had those competencies built in. So in other words, when we were doing the sprint planning, we made sure early on that there were use cases that included the processes, that included the change, and then when we did the sprint planning, we ensured that, for example, the change aspects of things, when we do the change assessment, that's built in early on within the, within the sprint cycles. So let's say in sprint two, we would have built in an item around doing the change assessment. While all the other pieces of the project is also happening. And then let's say in sprint five, we do the sprint planning, or we complete it. Then sprint seven, or seven to nine, we actually do the, do the, change, uh, change, uh, the, the change tactics delivery. 
So we built in multiple disciplines within the Agile practice, and no, way, no other way of doing it because you know projects are as complex as it can get. It's one of the major banks here. So they want to make sure that um, all of the disciplines are catered towards within the Agile framework, and that's how we, we achieved it. Uh, making sure that there are work streams by knowledge area or by center of excellence, and, and many of them were project, process, and change, including others like DA and QA and all of the others. In, in an Agile framework, though, you've got your, your user acceptance over the life of the sprint should mitigate your, the materiality of the change management. It's not all at once. So they, Correct. they're planning for it coming anyway, whatever it's what you're doing. Right. Right. And not all of the disciplines get executed at once, as you said. So that's why the sprint planning comes into play, where you know, initially as part of the backlog, we make sure that you know development, the actual, you know, the, the coding, let's say, the testing, the the process, the change, we have a backlog item for each one of those. And once when it gets triggered or when it gets delivered, it comes into the, the whole aspect of sprint planning. And yes, not all of that happens all at the same time. There's no perfect science to it, but um, but we at least have the the, the components built into the to the methodology. So you suggest the uh, change management should be done early in the early spring. And yeah. so. yeah. absolutely so. And this is and this is such a good question because we often think about change management as an after effect, mm -hmm. right? And if you look at the model, this is certainly not in order. You see the first two bullets there is change assessment and change planning. And no other way to really do that, uh, you know, without doing it very early on in the project, right? Involving the end users, planning for the end users very early on in the project, as opposed to post deployment. So yes. So. You have better success rate. Absolutely, better success rate. And we learned it through failure, right? Any questions on the model itself? Did everyone sort of get it? What is that? I have a question. In terms of your model, you have the goal or the objective as maximizing business value. Shouldn't that be the foundation of the model? Right. So good, good, good point. Right. <clears throat> um, how can I? Our weight is a function of things we do, right? Amount of money we have in the bank is a function of how we behave every day. Uh, talk about living large. Living large is a function of little things you do every day. So, the foundation is how do people behave? How are tools aligned? How are techniques? What kind of techniques do you have to deliver on the tools? And how are we delivering the services to our end clients? <coughs> That's sort of you know, what I see as the function, right? So therefore, that's the foundation. And on top of the house is sort of the, how do these functions integrate to the outcome, which is to maximize the business value. Of course, not saying that this is the perfect model, but that's the thinking that we have behind. Good question. Okay, yeah. so now you see how the whole aspect of projects around starting with maturity, then how you deliver the projects and how the big picture fits in needs to be aligned with organizational processes, how we do the automation of processes, and taking the specific case of robotic process automation, how that fits in to knowing your stakeholders, so that's where your change assessment comes in, planning for it very early on in the project, and then delivering on it, on it being delivering on change, just like you deliver on the product itself, and, and knowing how these three really fit in to, to deliver the foundation. And once you do all of those things right, I think you know that's the top of the house, which is uh, uh, maximizing business value, automatically comes into play. But don't be after the business value, because that really means nothing, right? Any questions on success stories? So you got the one with the post-merger? And the question around, 
You know, even if we're involved in one aspect of it, whether it's pro project or process or change, but having the mindset of integration, just like that Steve Jobs example, right? How he integrated calligraphy with you know, other things to deliver a great product that actually also made a lot of money. So knowing just because you're involved in one doesn't mean you get away from this integration mindset. It's a mindset, not what your day-to-day -day jobs are. And then knowing through managing people, getting the people involved, who to call on, leveraging people from process, who to call on from change if you're the project manager. If you're the BA, leveraging who to call on from project, from change, to deliver the, the business value, maximizing it. If you're in change, don't do it in a silo. No, you know, work with the project team, work with the process team, work with the end users to deliver, the, you know, maximize the value. So, you know, if I were going back 10 years old, 10 years back, if, if, you know, if I could use a book that, you know, that could actually help me or, you know, lower the, lower the, the, the failure rate on many of the projects or the work is knowing how to work with people. Right? And you know, there's two ways of doing it. You kind of get there anyway at some day. One is to learn a lot of, through a lot of failure, or to you know read a lot of books, you know, having this as a as a strong part of your personal development, and then and then being able to realize success soon. We may be on the Yes, of course. So how do you measure your success for each of the three categories, right? Do you have metrics that are built in that you measure later and you get customer feedback and benefit realizations? Right. How does that work? Right, absolutely. And, and what a great question as well. At the end of the day, how do you know you have maximized business value, right? And the better way to do it is through metrics, right? There's already some of the key metrics out there. How do you know whether your project has, has been delivered successfully? Not saying that you've delivered the right product, you've just delivered the project. So the basics, like, you know, what's up? It's on time. On time. And you've delivered it within the scope, right? And maybe profitability, which is a part of the budget anyway. Right? Those are some of the project metrics. There could be others as well, uh, such as deviation from your percentage deviation from your estimates, right? which is actually built into on time and on budget anyway. How do you measure process success? They call it key performance indicators. Performance is around process. But for each organization, defining what performance is each organization or each project, defining what performance is, right, for that organization. If I'm making improvements to procurement, um, some of the key performance indicators could be what is the number of days from request to close of a procurement request. Um, <clears throat> uh, there could be, you know, pricing related uh, performance indicators as well in procurement. So knowing what your key performance indicators are from a process perspective. From a change perspective, an interesting concept, but something that we're getting into a lot these days, is key behavioral indicator, right? One was the project indicators, then it was the key performance indicators, project process, and for change, it's key behavioral indicators. By that, what I mean is, let's say, <coughs> I'm moving from SAP to Oracle, or Oracle to SAP, I don't care. The end users are expected to change. You've got a department of 100 people. How many of them have successfully, you know, like basic metrics, like successfully moved from the older platform to the new platform? How many people are successfully being able to execute their day-to-day -day job um, in the newer platform? So that kind of thing, right? So we measure through project indicators, performance indicators, and behavioral indicators to show success on how we maximize the value, which is on top of the house. And often enough, these metrics need to be defined as well quite early in the pro project, as opposed to, again, that change. It's not an afterthought after the project. Is that a process function? Right. I would say building in metrics is built in within project process and change. 
within each of the each of the rooms as we talked about, as opposed to a different part or a room altogether. It's built in together, just like planning. You need to plan your project. You need to plan your change. You need to plan your process. Similarly, you need to identify the metrics for each one of those three. Another common piece like that will be resources. You need resources for project delivery, for uh, process, as well as change. Again, built in to each of those um, individuals so that you can get that integrated approach. But there's management of all three, right? So there's a, a head to the snake, right? There is, there is. And, and is that a program or director type management position? What is that typically? Right. So, of course, the role or the position is varying from one organization to another. But from a discipline perspective, and I'm not saying this is in the project management discipline, but there's a knowledge area called integrated, integrated management, where you take you know, the different areas, like you know, process, change, scope, time, resources, but you kind of integrate it together. So now who does it, whether it's project manager or program manager or director, that of course is varying, but yes, there would need to be some kind of a role, such as a project lead or even, a, even a, you know, product lead sometimes. Someone has to play that, the head of the snake kind of role. Yes. 10 minutes left, okay. Yes. Hi. Uh, you had an earlier example where you said you came in, you did the work, <clears throat> and then six months later, uh, a year yes. later, uh, the documentation is on the shelf, it wasn't updated and all that. When your company works with uh, another company like that, do you visit them two years later and do a house call and say, we're going to do a reassessment and tell you how well you've been doing since then? Right. So it also depends on the relationship you have within the organization. So in that particular case, we had done a process design for them, but they didn't really do anything with that process design other than the fact that, okay, it was, it, that process part really went well, but okay, what about it, right? So you know that through ongoing conversation uh, with the clients, right, that you want to have anyway. So you're not doing probably going back as a formal engagement, which you could, uh, to kind of go back and measure how well we did, you know, a year later, but also through conversations with the clients, you know, you know maybe a coffee meeting or a meeting uh, six months or 12 months down the road, hey, what happened to the process work that we did? And how far did it go? Right? That's one way. That's the informal way. But more formally, and I know actually, uh, you know, major consulting firm McKinsey, they for each of their client engagement that they deliver, they go back 12 months down the road and they see the benefits that were promised, you know, last year. How far are they to realizing it? They actually do. That's actually built into their statement of work that we are going to show up 12 months later to do that. Right? So when you have something formal like that, you can certainly kind of go back and kind of do that assessment, but you could do it formally or even informally like the other way that I have mentioned, if the formalities are not built into your contractual kind of obligations. How typical would that be that companies would uh, put in their SLW that, hey, we're gonna check up on you? Yeah, very not typical. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, what's the, other, what's the better way to say it? <laughs> it's not, yeah. Like, eight, eight. at that point, if they're coming back later, then like who's accountable, right? If they're coming back a year later to see yeah. how well you've integrated, then are they accountable or um, are you accountable for not yeah. being able to integrate that? Right. The other piece is it's not kind of have I hit zero to one. It's the journey, right? If I were zero, am I at point seven today? That's a really good thing. I haven't got to one, right? And, um, you know, business speak, like, you know, obviously these things are built in for a reason. If they say, oh, you're at point 0.7, I can get you to point 0.3 more, or maybe 1.5 if you do these other things, right? That's how they get the next engagement as well. But the point is that it is not a zero to one binary thing. It's progression. It's the journey that counts. And if you have shown that, you know, we were supposed to go from zero to one a year from now, but hey, we're at point 0.7, uh, I don't see any executive being disappointed with that. So your change has to always come from the top down, right? Absolutely. So. And then how do you get buy-in from the doers? Yes. The people that need to change their lives, right? Right. Because you can you can fail if you don't 
it, you know, it, it's a short, a top-down change management is, is a short-term thing, right? Long term, you have to you have to make sure that everybody's on board. Right, absolutely. So, as part of the planning goes, we usually you know think of planning as well as delivering change from the perspective of at least five axes: um, leadership involvement, stakeholder or user involvement, training. This is a formal training. Not, fourth one is coaching. So this is around not training but one-on-one, -on -one. Can, how can I help you? And the fifth one is, uh, so when you talked about the metrics, how can we measure? So by building in uh, leadership involvement, specific tactics around that, like we talked about, you know, town halls, visible communications from leadership, shows that they're engaged, they want this to happen. Uh, stakeholder involvement, involving them early on in design and even planning, that, that an after, after fact, after the fact. Um, delivering training that's relevant, that they can take back at the end of the day and learn more. Delivering, having a strong train the trainer or coaching program around one-on-one -on -one coaching. You know, when, once they get stuck, you know, at, at 11 or 3 a.m., who's there to support them? And then the key behavior, behavioral indicators is around metrics. So involving stakeholders, or I should say, you talk about leadership, is very much built in to the planning and delivery of change. Okay, any other questions? Did you all learn something today? Yes. What did you learn? What's the one thing you want to take away? It's Don't not work in silos. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love it. Don't work in silos. I, I just, it's a reiteration of the importance of the relationship between those three. That's right. That's a great takeaway, relationship between the three. Do you want to do a draw? I, I, want, to be, I want to be objective here. So I'll let anyone pick. Do you want to do that? Oh, I have my there. You have yours? Okay, so good luck. <laughs> okay, what do we have? Alex Latona. Alex Latona, wow. <laughs> Alex, congratulations. So on managing people, right? Congrats. Okay, awesome folks. If any of you want to carry on the conversation further,